Welcome to Municipal Affairs. I'm your host, Christopher Brown. In the recent years, the Rural Municipalities of Alberta has been conducting surveys to assess the landscape of municipal property taxes, particularly in relation to the oil and gas industry. The latest findings as of December 31st, 2023, are concerning to the municipal organization. A staggering $251.8 million of municipal property taxes remain unpaid by oil and gas companies, despite their legal obligations to do so. Now, this marks the sixth consecutive year of such surveys by the RMA, revealing a persistent issue within the industry. Unfortunately, a small number of companies continue to disregard their fiscal responsibilities, posing a significant challenge for local rural municipalities. Today, we are honored to have with us RMA President Paul McLaughlin to shed light on the ongoing dilemma and discuss potential solutions moving forward. This is Municipal Affairs. Paul, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Uh, RMA just released as of this afternoon, uh, February 27th, that your sixth consecutive survey from rural municipalities had come back and you were still owed outstanding oil and gas property taxes from across the province this year alone, $43 million extra. And that brings the total of unpaid property taxes to almost actually just over a quarter of a billion dollars owed to rural municipalities. Take me through what you're thinking right now when it comes to these derelict zombie oil and gas companies. You know, Chris, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Like you said, six years, it's hard to even imagine. Um, you know, I have to I have to commend municipal affairs. They, I mean, they put in place a, a special lien. Uh, we had a minister order a year ago. That was the silver bullet. That would be doing it. Uh, the stark reality of this conversation is this is causing just untold impairment to municip municipalities across Alberta. Uh, the 69 municipalities that I represent from border to border to border are impacted by this. In fact, it's actually quite uniform. Most of our members actually uniformly have, uh, most of our districts have that. It's also surface leases, Chris. I mean, the, the reality is, is that these are companies that that are being allowed to operate. And, and we're asking quite boldly, and and, and is, is for the AR to quit being a cheerleader and to be a regulator. To, they have provisions under Directive 67 to actually enforce looking at unpaid taxes and surface leases as, as one of the indicators of whether or not you can operate an oil and gas facility in the province of Alberta. Instead, this literally the AR, through this process, the AR has consistently not looked at that because, again, we've had another 44 45 million dollars adding to this un untold tax bill it's frustrating to my members it's caused almost insolvency risk to some of my members um we don't even ask for new rules we're asking them to just enforce what's already available to them so my members have had enough uh they are frustrated completely for this um they're all supportive of oil and gas this needs to be fixed uh the ar has the ability to fix it and they just need to start doing their job this does the one reoccurring thing that I know that I'm going to talk about every year is going to be oil and gas uh, taxes with you on this show. Um, this doesn't seem to be going away. What can the provincial government do tomorrow or even today to help rectify this? Because almost like I said, a quarter of a billion dollars is a lot of money for a lot of municipalities to fix bridges, to fix roads, to fix infrastructure that is falling apart right now. For sure, Chris. And and you know what? I'm going to give you the two-minute elevator speech on how how the AER regulates oil and gas facilities in the province of Alberta. So they have a provision called the liability management ratio. So basically, it's a measure of assets to liabilities. Now that is saying whether or not you're solvent or not. And if you're not, if you're not in that piece, they start to ask for bonds to kind of push your number up. And the number, the magic number is two. So if you're you, you're above two, you got it. You got lots of assets. You got cash flow. Things are good. If you're below two, you start to get a little bit of pressure on you. The problem is, there's a few problems with that, is the actual liability calculation is more art than science. And so if you actually look at the math, they probably, the liabilities are probably quite a bit higher. The other piece of this is that these zombies, and those are the ones that start to get the blow to, the stark reality is, is that really you've got a cheerleader regulator uh, instead of a regulator because a lot of these companies these are the ones that aren't paying taxes typically and these are the ones not paying surface leases they're actually using taxes and surface leases just to keep themselves afloat the industry knows this is there there's about 230 238 of them right now functioning on the landscape and the question i've asked is that why hasn't this been fixed? Everybody asks me this. Why the AR has Directive 67? Why hasn't this been fixed? It's my speculation that if the AR actually enforced directive, under Directive 67 the payment of taxes and surface leases as a requirement, they need to be paid in full. 
for the operating of oil and gas facility, uh, likely you'd have 18,000 wells moved to the orphan well fund instantaneously. Um, you literally would have the insolvency of hundreds of companies. And for some reason, and reasons unknown to me, that nobody wants to pull the Band-Aid off and get that over with, because when is it going to be fixed? So we had an oil low and gas prices. Every time we have this conversation, gas is low, oil is high, oil is low, gas is high. We constantly are using this commodity to drive the conversation. We need to actually regulate this like the industry it should be. There, the majority of the industry are great players. There's, there's hundreds of players that are doing a great job paying their taxes ensuring that they're fulfilling all their community involvement and community investment. And the sad thing is that rural Albertans get left out in the cold because we're actually keeping a bunch of bad apples still operating and the AER knows better. They know they shouldn't be doing this and they still continue to do this. What's the province saying to you about this? Because the AER is a separate entity from the provincial government, but they are appointed by the provincial government. Is the provincial government telling you anything about why this has not moved in the direction that it should be moving? Well, I constantly am told, and, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll say that, you know, Minister McIver has been a great advocate for us. And, and I don't want to select him out because it was Minister Schultz was a great advocate for us too. And I, I'm on my third premier that said, yeah, you should pay your taxes. Everyone should pay their taxes. Paying your taxes is an important part. When you get down to that one push, that one final piece, and it's amazing every time I talk to a minister, yeah, everyone should pay their taxes. Yeah, there's no way. But if you get back to that one final piece that all the government has to do is say to the AER, enforce Directive 67, make sure that you ensure that payment of tax and surface leases is part of the operation capacity, and, and that'd be over with. And once it, But it doesn't ever get past that. The reason why is because there's a house of cards in part of this industry. No one wants to admit it. My members see it on a daily basis. I've seen the insolvency sheets of some of these companies have gone under. They've been let gone way too long. By the time the actual plug gets pulled on them, um, they've literally liquidated everything. And basically, mom and pa uh, welding companies don't get paid. Surface lease owners don't get paid. Taxes don't get paid. All of rural Alberta suffers from a very small number of people that could be fixed instantaneously if the regulator regulated. What happens now? Because we, you and I both know that we're in the, a financial crisis right now across this country. A lot of municipalities are struggling to pass budgets that are not going to be passed on the backs of the residents that they are there to serve. With now $43 million extra on top of the already growing uh, sort of costs that the municipalities are incurring, what does this mean for your members? You talk about insolvency. Are you saying that municipalities are potentially going under if this doesn't rectify itself this year? Well, and, and you know, the premier said that the industry has got about 10 good years left in it. So when do you fix this? You fix this in year 11? Um, you don't. You fix it now. You fix it now knowing that this is as good as it's going to get. And, you know, we need to have the courage to lead. Um, my members have constantly written off written off uh, taxes that they shouldn't have had to write, write, write written off. They actually, those, some of those assets could have been transferred to solvent companies that could have, fun could have functioned and paid their taxes. My members have kind of had enough, Chris. Um, we've been talking about this for six years. Uh, I've been the president for more than three now. Uh, I picked up this ball from, from Al Camry, the, the prior president. Um, it has not been getting better. It's been getting worse. And it's been getting worse in a situation where we're hearing that, that really the industry is getting close to its peak. So when do you fix this? You fix it tomorrow, you fix it today. Um, I'm surprised. I said to my members, I said, uh, you know, I'm willing to go nuclear. In other words, I really want to call out the, the, the fact that the AR is allowing these zombies to wander around our landscape. And, and to solve the zombie problem, they're putting little band-aids on them saying, oh, it's good, we got this. They don't have it. And, and if you actually, by reflection, if you start talking about what the liabilities to Albertans are. So let's go back to that LMR number I was telling you about. So there's a, right now, I think there's 238 companies with an LMR below two, if I last re recall. Um, if you, but if you actually look at that number, um, the, the stark reality is, is that those companies in most likely probably are actually the ones owing most of the money. 55% are still functioning. Um, we can make a big decision on when we're going to pull the, pull the pin on this, but you're, it's cheaper to pull the pin now than later. And I think that dragging your feet does not make the liabilities decrease. I've been around long enough that the liabilities of those companies have gone from 1.8 billion to now close to 4 billion. It will be 5 billion at the end of this. Where does the money come from to clean that up? 
It comes from industry. Indust those wells get shuffled to the Orphan Well Association. So the industry, the CAPS and the EPACs should be supporting this too as well. And the short term, it's going to hurt. And the long term, it's bad. You know, my, my municipal friends, they basically have said right across the board, they said, we, you just need to go and fix this. And my municipality's written off $6.8 million. A pretty significant blow to the good folks of Pinocchio County that pay their taxes. I have some great operators right now that I've got a pipeline going through my property right now, Chris, and that company's paying their taxes. Um, they're they're ensuring that their land, their their surface leases are being paid. Um, these are the operators that we want. These are the operators that the industry wants. And, uh, you know, turning a blind eye to this part of the industry is hurting all Albertans. Exactly like you said, the downloadings continue. If this continues on, the solvency of many rural municipalities will be impaired by something that easily could be fixed by the AR. Has any of your members reached out to any of these zombie organizations, zombie uh, oil company, oil and gas companies to say, pay up or we're going to potentially take you a further step further and take you to court? 100%. And you know what they've done? I'll tell you how cool some of these people are. Um, the check's in the mail. I uh, had a company that actually took a picture of a check and said, this check's in the mail. Check never came. Uh, we've had, well, I've had municipalities using legal resources to the tunes of hundreds of thousands of dollars to try to put pressure on these companies. They've drug it out and eventually pulled the pin. Uh, in one case, I had, a, I had a municipality that actually negotiated a payment plan because we're compassionate tax people. You don't get that situation with the, the government of Canada. You can't say, hey, can I pay it like, you know, when I get money? We're pretty nice that way. So I've had members that actually hired lawyers, negotiated agreements, negotiated payment plans, and then a payment payment didn't come. And one of my members called up the company and said, hey, like, where's that, that payment? They're like, oh, we're trying to sell. So, you know, we're like, can you give us another month? Like, this is a regulated industry that's literally playing this game. And the hard part is, is that in many cases, this money's being offshored. And if you wait too long, literally, if you don't enforce... We've seen situations of these companies creating holding companies, throwing assets in a holding company, leasing it back to the main company. And by the time we get to it, there is nothing left. There's literally, it's been stripped dry. When I was a kid, my dad's been in the oil industry and I've been involved in the oil industry my whole life. And back in the day, it was geologists in cowboy boots and big cowboy hats. That's who run the industry. Who runs the industry now is lawyers and accountants. And, and literally, if there's a hole that you can drive through, the majority of the industry won't drive through that. But if you leave a big hole, people will go through it. And the AER left a, a place the size of a bus. And there's a bunch of bad actors driving right through that on a daily basis. You, you talk about EPAC and CAP needing to come to the table and actually start advocating for uh, with alongside RMA, uh, sort of asking them to come out in favor of your requests for the AER to do more on this file and implement uh, Section 67. Have you had conversations with these two organizations and what have they said or are they sort of sort of playing the long game as well? Well, you know, and I, I've had great, I have had great feedback from both CAP and EPAC, and I can't speak to them on these new numbers because these just got released. Uh, historically, they've said the same thing. Uh, everybody should pay their taxes. They've canvassed back to their members, and and they've said that any of anybody that belongs to CAP and EPAC uh, need to pay their taxes. The problem is, is that those are two advocacy organizations that you don't actually need to be be involved in or actually be a member of. So they're speaking for definitely a large component of the industry. And in fact, I would say the members of CAP and EPAC are who we're actually fighting for, because having this conversation uh, is really a black eye in the entire industry. The majority of the folks, and, and it's funny, when I talk to oil and gas producers, because I do, I work in the industry, I, I have relationships with multiple people. We're all one degrees of, I think I have oil in my veins, Chris. And and the stark reality is, is that they're going, you know what, this has been going on too long. And you know what I had one senior senior oil and gas guy say? Said, this has taken way longer than it should have. And I'm like, sorry, what's taken so long? You know, kind of the zombies, the insolvency, the zombies, like this is dragging on way longer than anybody thought it would. And, and really, we got to start to dig because some of these zombies, Chris, um, if I do a little poking around, um, I think they've been funded by AIMCO. So, you know... There's some there's some real interesting uh, sleuthing that can be done, um, I think, by many people to really look into what this conversation is. And uh, I'm actually just an a MAV advocacy member. I, I'm not in the ability to tell you who, uh, what, where and how. Uh, these numbers have been aggregated, but definitely my members are willing to start telling conversations. They're wanting to have this conversation uh, because this is an existential crisis for rural Alberta and uh, it needs to be fixed.
Now, uh, you, RMA is hosting uh, their spring convention in Edmonton in March, uh, literally next month. And I'm assuming the premier or some ministers will be there. I'm assuming you will be, quote unquote, going nuclear in those con uh, meetings or those that convention as well to make sure that this is addressed in a timely fashion, right? Yeah. And, you know, I'm not a hijack guy. I don't like to hijack <laughs> or gotcha government. They know every five things I'm going to do next. Uh, they knew that this was going to come out. They knew what the numbers were. I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't try to sneak up on them. Um, they know they have to fix it. Um, and, and I think that, like I said, I will not disrespect the the actions that were taken before. I had every expectation that they would fix it. There's only one way to fix it, and is that is that for a cheerleader to uh, pull on their regul regulatory pants and go jump around with their pom poms? Always a pleasure to sit down with you and chat with you, Paul. Thanks, Chris. Have a good one. Now, if today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth conversations on the cross-border interviews and our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. Now, we are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. Now, your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of the top-notch content you have come to enjoy over the last year. Now, if you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.